St. Valentine's Day is, in a way, a very strange feast because the Catholic Church has removed St. Valentine from, or Valentine from its liturgical calendar. The reason probably being that we are not exactly certain who we are talking about. We know that there was an ancient tradition to pray to St. Valentine as the protector and the patron saint of the lovers, but St. Valentine was uh, worshipped, or worshipped, was venerated, I should say, only God is worshipped, was venerated in two places. In Rome, as a priest who lived in Rome and was martyred, but there's also another Valentine whose remains are buried in Terni, which is a city quite far from Rome towards the east. That Valentine was a bishop. So for a while, historians weren't sure that, you know, who, who is this person on the calendar? A few years ago, we, um, uh, we made a television episode. Uh, Inga was there with me. And we tried to trace the, you know, the places where Valentine was venerated and, and try to figure out who was he really. And our conclusion, and this is also the conclusion of historians recently, is that it's still probably the same person who worked as a priest in Rome first, then became a bishop in Terni and was killed ultimately there as a martyr. No matter what makes it so special is that, of course, we as a church don't celebrate the, the, the day anymore, February the 14th, which was already his feast day in the 5th century. The Pope back then instituted February the 14th as the day on which he was martyred. So we kind of forgotten, have forgotten about St. Valentine, whereas the world around us celebrates it. Not by going to church, by the way, but with flowers and chocolates and, you know, little acts of kindness. And maybe, maybe one day, you know, the Pope will bring St. Valentine back to the liturgical calendar. I certainly hope so, because his message is very important in this time. And I'll, I'll explain how this, this feast of, of his martyrdom how it relates to the gospel of today and to the message of the gospel. But first of all, let me remind you of a scene that most uh, geeks and Star Wars fans are very familiar with. It is maybe the most romantic moment in the Star Wars movies. You know that in Star Wars you have this princess and her name is Leia and she's rescued by a Jedi, Luke, or a Jedi in training, and his pal, a smuggler, a rogue kind of guy called Han Solo. And at first, these two don't like each other at all. Princess Leia thinks that Han Solo is a, you know, a barbarian. He doesn't want to have, to have anything to do with him. But there is also a spark. And after a while, they fall in love. And at one point, Han Solo is being captured by evil Darth Vader and his stormtroopers, and he's about to be frozen and sold as a bounty to an evil uh, mob boss called Jabba the Hutt. And Leia has to witness how Han Solo is being lowered in this carbonite machine where maybe he won't even survive. And right before, he is lowered into that kind of, you could say, a tomb, what may be the end of his life. He, uh, he looks at her, her one more time, and she tells him, she's restrained by the stormtroopers, and she tells him, I love you. And then he looks at her and says, I know. <laughs> and it is so romantic because, you know, they don't have to tell each other anymore. They know that they love each other. The thing is, that moment where they only have to look at each other to know that they belong to each other, that there is love that binds them together in, in that incredible, you know, dangerous moment where maybe their love 
will end there because he will be killed. That moment was preceded by all sorts of other moments of tenderness, a kiss that is interrupted by C-3PO, etc. And bit by bit, all these little moments, also the, the fights that they have, show that they care. Because if you fight, it means that the other person is important to you. So fights are part of every relation, any relationship, and it's not just a bad thing. Fights in a relationship can also help you discover what is important for the other person. And reconciliation and forgiveness can make the bond stronger after the fight than it was before. It's very strange how that works. And sometimes in relationships, we tend to take it for granted that we love each other. And we don't express it as much as in the beginning when you fall in love, you know, you bring flowers and you write cards and letters and emails and you, you, walk, you go for long walks together and you embrace and you hug and kiss. But I've seen it so often that when you've been together for many, many years, people start to forget that sometimes you have to tell one another and show one another that you still love each other. Love always demands a visualization. Love, if it's just words or just an assumption, well, I know that she or he loves me, and you never show it with symbols and signs, you may actually start to lose that bond. And the symbols and the moments that you express that love, I love you, I know, those are moments that that love becomes stronger again. Love is something that you always have to keep alive by, by acts of love and acts of kindness. And if you forget about that, which is very human to just assume it, then it can start to erode. This is where the practice of many people on this day, St. Valentine, to write a card, to give each other flowers, sometimes anonymous, sometimes not. It, I think it's a translation of what we all know should happen if you love someone. If you never express it, the other person doesn't know. I remember that when I was in, in secondary school, uh, in, 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 what is it, uh, I, I think I was 17, I had just started to discover my faith and I was thinking about maybe God calls me to become a priest. And I remember that exactly that year had never happened before. On February 14, I receive a handwritten card with hearts on it, all in pink and red, with an anonymous letter <laughs> from someone who expressed her love for me. Until today, I don't know who it was. But a few weeks later, I told the class that I was going to go to seminary and become a priest. So <laughs> had I not received that card, I would have never known that there was a person in my life who actually was you know, romantically interested. <laughs> but then my love was for, you know, for, for God. And so I followed that love. But these, these signs are important because it shows you that you're close to the other person. Love requires expression. Now, in the gospel of today, this is exactly the core reason that this episode was written down. In the first reading, we hear all the prescriptions when it comes to people that are dangerously ill and, and may contaminate other people. Leprosy was dangerous. It wasn't that contagious. It wasn't as bad as COVID. But once you got it, there was no cure. And so people were extremely afraid of getting infected and getting leprosy because you would start to lose your limbs and become disfigured. And there was no way to stop the disease. And that is why in the first reading you hear these prescriptions. If someone has a skin disease, He's got to inform the responsible people of the church, or, well, in this case, <laughs> the Jewish faith, 
and then very strict rules come into place. That person can no longer be part of the community. You have to stay away. And if you are near anyone else, you have to start yelling that you're impure. And it was forbidden to touch someone with leprosy. It would make yourself, you would become impure as well. Logical rules in a time when there was no vaccination or, or cure for these kind of diseases. But of course, a horrible, horrible experience for those that were afflicted by that disease. Imagine that all of a sudden you lose everything you have, your work, your friends, your family, your position in the town where you lived, your future, and instead you're pushed away. You have to live with other people that are just as sick as you are. And you've, I mean, it's as if there is a massive distance between you and the rest of the community. That, I think, is the real pain. It's the, what hurts the most. Being sick, of course, it, it's, it's not fun. No, I've had COVID, uh, you had it, Inge had it. it you, you're really miserable for a couple of weeks. And even afterwards, there are lots of remaining uh, problems. But it's in the end, it's not, you know, not as bad if you have friends, if you have people that care for you and that express the fact that you're not alone in this. So if you get a, a card or an email or flowers or a, a phone call, that makes you feel like, you know, I'm sick, but I'm not alone. And it makes it more bearable. But it's much worse if you're sick and nobody cares. You're forgotten by everyone. That is what truly hurts. And it's worse than any physical disease. Um, the other day I was in Schiedam filming an episode about the life of Saint uh, Lidwina, a Dutch girl who at the age of 15 went out skating outside. And she fell and broke a rib. And the wound got infected. She ended up in bed. The doctor was unable to cure her. And she has been sick for the rest of her life. She never got out of bed after that fall on the ice. And the worst thing that she experienced, and we know this because she was written down, it was not the pain of the infection, and it was horrible, but it was that she heard her friends outside playing and talking and going out, and she couldn't join them. And when the priest came to visit her and told her, you have to connect your suffering to the suffering of Christ, you know what she said? Get out of here. That's what... What use are those pious thoughts? You know, I'm miserable. Everybody has forgotten me. God has abandoned me. Why am I sick? I'm 15 years old. My future is destroyed. I may die. But the priest kept coming, and every time he brought her the communion. And bit by bit, slowly, this girl started to change her opinion. Instead of feeling that she was abandoned by God and by everyone, the priest, by visiting her, showed her that he cared, that the church cared. The people, her friends that visited her, the people of the you know, other faithful that came to see her, she, re she realized all of a sudden, well, you know what? I still have to be there, I can listen. I can maybe help them with some advice. And what is amazing is that bit by bit, the people that visited her, who came to her to help her, were helped by Lidwina, by her, her encouragement, by her prayers, by her words. Everybody, when they, after they visited Lidwina, when they came back uh, and stepped outside, they all had a smile on their face. They felt strong because of the encouragement of Lidwina. And Lidwina started to have visions of a guardian angel sent by God who was at her side all these years. And in her dreams, the guardian angel would take her to Rome and to the Holy Land and to travel and fly around. And that was an incredible 
feeling for her that in the midst of her handicap and being completely cloistered to, to her bed, God had not given up on her. And he reached out to her and touched her time and again. That is what kept her going. And the real miracle is that she stayed alive despite the fact that with a wound and an infection like that, you probably would die within a year. She lived to reach the age of 53. At the very last moment in her life, she started to doubt. And the God who had always supported her and carried her in that miserable disease, all of a sudden seemed to be absent and the angel that had been in her dreams almost every day suddenly didn't visit her anymore. And she started to feel extremely alone again. And the suffering came back. And she prayed and prayed and prayed, just like the leper here in the gospel. God, if you want, you can help me. Only say the word and my soul shall be healed. And one day that prayer was here, was was heard by God and the angel reappeared and told her, do you see this, this rose bush? So it was a, in her dreams she saw, you know, a, a bush of roses, but they hadn't, there weren't flowers yet. It was winter. And the, the angel said, if these roses will flower on that day, I will take you with me for our biggest journey and will bring you to heaven. And the day before she died, she had a vision of the same rose bush filled with beautiful red roses. And she died with a smile on her face. It is an amazing story that shows us that even if you are sick, if your life has no apparent use anymore, if you feel alone, that sometimes in these difficult moments, God can reveal himself to be close to you to reach out and to bridge the gap that you feel yourself when you're alone. This is what happens in the gospel when this leper breaks all the rules. He does not obey the rules given by Moses. And he had to keep his distance. And instead of yelling, impure, impure, stay away from me, he calls Jesus and says, you can help me, I know this, I believe in you. If you want it, it will happen. It's a beautiful expression of faith in the power of the love of Jesus. And then Mark, the way Mark writes this down, if you look at the original text, it says that Jesus was like moved on the inside. He was almost nauseous with the, the, the empathy that he felt. And it, it's obvious that he must have felt not just the physical disease, but the loneliness of this man. He was the only one that would still listen to this leper. And so after this leper has broken the rules and approached Jesus, Jesus breaks the rules. And he touches the man because he knows I, can, I have to do more than just a few pious words here. This man needs to feel that I'm close to him. And Jesus says, I want it, I want it, be clean. How powerful is that? To hear from Jesus, I don't want you to be sick. I want to heal you. This must happen, and it happens because he's the son of God, he's the word of God. The same word that created heaven and earth is now the word that heals this man. And the man is filled with, with love and gratitude. And then the story has a strange ending. Mark writes that Jesus admonishes him, don't tell anyone. And you could wonder why. The reason is Jesus is still at the start of his mission. He, this is one of the first miracles that he does. And he knows that he has opponents and if they hear about him breaking the rules to heal a leper, that that may actually bring his mission to a quick end. And so, because if everyone knows what he does, then also his opponents will know, and maybe they will capture him before he can begin his journey. 
And so that is why Jesus imposes the secret, don't do this, because then I can't be among people anymore, it's too risky. And that's exactly what happens. The man still starts to tell everyone in his enthusiasm. And Jesus cannot appear in public anymore. So he steps away. But then, end good, all good, the gospel tells us that the people, if Jesus doesn't come to them, they will come to see Jesus. They bridge the distance. And they come to see him and visit him. This is so full of meaning in this time of social distancing and fear of disease, of vulnerability, where we all have discovered how fragile we are. We can stay stuck like St. Lidwina at first, angry at God, why does this happen to me? I don't deserve this. Or we can try to approach God, bring him closer in our lives, ask him to be close to us. And ask yourself, how can I be close to the people around me? What can I do? Even if I have to keep my distance physically, it doesn't mean that I can't be close to people with my heart, with little signs of kindness and love. If we do that, then maybe this time, in the end, will reveal itself to be a time of grace, where we discover that God has been closer to us than ever before, in this time where we only think of distance and isolation. When it comes to our own mission, our own actions during this time, think of what I said at the beginning. Love needs expression. If you want to comfort other people, show it, tell it. Give them signs that you care. Because if you just assume that they do, the other person may not feel it. But if you show your love just like Jesus did by reaching out, then the contact will be made. When you say, I love you, the other person will probably tell you, I know. Amen. <laughs>